where torches actually used throughout history like we see them used in movies, in video games or read about in books? Short answer, no. But stick around and you'll find out how they were actually used. Hello everyone and welcome to Funky Monkey MP, the place where you get your weekly dose of miniature painting, history and world building. I'm glad to see you all here. On today's episode we'll be talking about a very interesting and important topic in my opinion, light sources in ancient and medieval times. We're gonna be covering all of them, from torches to candles and everything in between. It's gonna be a blast, believe me. Before we start shedding some light on this particular topic, let's talk about the miniature. Today I will be painting a miniature from WizKids, a Deva, a celestial being. I hope you have as much fun watching me paint it as I had doing so. And with that out of the way, let's set the scene. In ancient medieval times, fire was unfortunately a common occurrence and as you might imagine it was, like today, devastating and deadly. This was because most of the settlements were constructed out of wood and people didn't have access to the preventive measures we have access to, such as fire-resistant building materials, fire alarms or extinguishers. They did have fire brigades, but unfortunately they were usually there to stop the spread of fires, not put them out as they were poorly equipped by today's standards. They had buckets of water, they had cisterns, they had at one point pressurized water. But unfortunately it wasn't enough to put out large scale fires throughout settlements. This being said, there were different methods that people employed to prevent fire from breaking out. One of the most important measures were decrees that prohibited the use of open flames after a certain hour in the night. This was implemented in the Roman Empire, in larger cities, and it was usually followed. But as you might imagine, not always, and as such, for example, Rome was subject to many, many large-scale fires that devastated large parts of the city and it had to undergo multiple reconstruction phases. One of the most famous fires in Roman history is that of 64 AD when a fire devastated the city for six days. It was an immense tragedy. But now let's talk about fire sources and how people developed fire sources and tried to prevent fires at the same time. In prehistory, as you might imagine, people didn't have a lot of options when it came to light sources. The most widespread light source were campfires and they were also a source of heat and protection against wild animals and the dangers and horrors of the night. But people needed a mobile version of a light source. As such, they started lighting the ends of sticks, but they didn't burn for long, so they started burning bundles of sticks. But again, they didn't burn that long, and then they started burning bundles of dried grass. Again, a very good light source, but it burns too quickly. Slowly, they got creative and inventive, and please don't be under the impression that People in prehistory or ancient times or medieval times were dumb. They weren't, they just had access to less technology, but they were as creative and as inventive as we are today, but their tools were simpler. Slowly but surely, they realized that if you wrap the end of the stick in different fibers, such as hemp, this would extend the life of the torch. And then they realized that if you dip this wrapped end in animal fat, this would extend the life of the torch even more. Slowly, they started developing different methods of lighting their surroundings, 
with different materials and with less effort and for longer periods of time. Interestingly enough, I remember from university, during our anthropology courses, our teacher showed us all this research done around the position of light sources in relation to cave paintings. Apparently, over decades, researchers started trying to identify where the light sources would be while people were cave painting. And by doing so, they started identifying the positions of the light sources and they started revealing older, faded cave paintings that were missed for so long. It is truly impressive and interesting to see how such a small thing such as the position of the light source had such a big impact and has an impact on how we nowadays understand cave painting. It is, for me at least, truly, truly impressive. Now, we need to move on to antiquity, but before we do so, let's shed some light on this little miniature. For this miniature I went with Fenrisian Grey for the skin color, as it is the closest to the depiction in the monster manual, at least as I see it. After mixing a bit of Scar White in the Fenrisian Grey, I am adding highlights to the torso and the face of the miniature, outlining the features making them pop a little more. I am happy with the progress thus far. I will continue adding more and more white scar with each new layer and apply the mix to smaller and smaller areas, defining them better, catching the details. Welcome to antiquity. There is a misconception that throughout history, until modern times, people went to bed with the sunset and got up with the sunrise. This is quite false. People, although got up quite early with the sunrise because they had a lot of things to do, they didn't go to bed with sundown. Imagine in winter when the sun goes down around 5.30, maybe 6.00, it would be way too early to go to bed. People in prehistory, ancient times and medieval times stayed up longer. They wanted to have fun, they went to parties, they went to feasts, they read books and they played games. People didn't go to bed with sundown. But because it was still dark outside, you needed to light your surroundings. And not all chambers had a fireplace and, in case of ancient times, when there was a decree to extinguish all flames, you still wanted to light your surroundings, so people got inventive really fast. Besides torches that we won't touch right now, they had oil lamps, they had candles and they had rush lights. We're gonna go through them one by one because all of them are quite, quite interesting. So let's start by talking about rush lights. Rush lights are a very old light source. You would have to gather rush, it's a common enough plant. You would dry it for a while and then take the spongy interior, the pith, dip it in oil or in animal fat, let it dry and then light it. Depending on the length of the pith, it could burn for half an hour to perhaps an hour. That doesn't sound that long, but you could always light another one. They were very, very, very cheap to make. It was a plant available to everyone and you could spend a few hours to just get the pith and dip it in oil. Get the pith, dip it in oil. Then let it dry for a few hours and solidify. This didn't take too long to make and you had an almost, almost free light source. The plant didn't cost anything, and animal fat was quite, quite available throughout history, as it is today. The light it shed wasn't too bright, but it was good enough for one to read, or to simply play games, or to chat, or to simply contemplate life in the dim light of a rush candle. Oil lamps. As you might imagine, oil lamps are a little bit more expensive than rush lights because there is craftsmanship that goes into their production. Oil lamps are a very simple concept. They are a container filled with animal fat or with oil in which a wick is partially submerged and as long as fat 
and oil are available and the wick is refreshed from time to time, you have a very long lasting light source. Romans actually had a very interesting relationship with oil lamps. They made a huge variety of oil lamps, they made them from different materials. Some of the more expensive were made of terracotta, the red kind, which was quite quite expensive and quite refined. And they really liked decorating their oil lamps. Interestingly enough, there is evidence that oil lamps were sometimes made in Roman military forts by soldiers who were either bored or who wanted to simply earn a little bit more. And Romans loved decorating their oil lamps with phalluses, with penises. In the ancient Roman world, the penis was a symbol of good fortune. That's why there are many, many representations. And as you can see, these are some good luck charms. Enjoy. There are cases when oil lamps were upgraded with a small metal screen that helped in reflecting and diffusing the light. Now let's talk about lanterns. Lanterns are not as we understand them today, they are not flashlights. They were small containers made usually out of wood in which an oil lamp or a candle was placed and light was diffused. In D&D you have the lantern and the hooded lantern, so the same principle. But they didn't have glass, so the walls of the lantern were made out of metal pierced metal or out of very thin horn. Candles. Candles have been around for thousands of years and some credit the Romans with the invention of candles although there were several other people and civilizations that came up with the same principle and same inventions. The Romans took papyrus and rolled it up and dipped it in wax until they achieved the desired dimension of the candle. In China, people would roll up rice paper and do the same thing. In Japan, people would take different wicks and dip them in beeswax or the wax of different trees. While in India, they boiled cinnamon fruit and dipped wicks in the liquid. To be honest, I never knew that cinnamon had fruit and apparently the fruit of the cinnamon tree is also edible. It blew my mind. <laughs> Only now have I realized or learned that the cinnamon tree actually produces fruit. Mind blown. <laughs> that says a lot about me, doesn't it? Well, anyway, let's move on. Candles were quite expensive because beeswax and the waxy secretions of different insects or the waxy secretions of different plants were kind of hard to come by. Or you had to boil a lot of cinnamon tree fruit. But with the invention of candles came something else. The invention of the candle clock. Candle clocks are quite an interesting invention in my opinion. It is a very, very simple concept, but very effective. You would take candles of a certain size, a certain girth and a certain height, and you would measure the time it took for them to burn. Once that time was established, you would mark intervals by using pins or nails. The candle would be set on a metal plate and once the set time elapsed, the pin would fall and make noise when it hit the metal plate. Candles could be divided in 10 minutes interval, 15 minutes interval, 20 minutes interval, an hour interval or even more. And the 10 minutes interval really takes the snooze button to a whole new level, doesn't it? This was a tremendous development in timekeeping and you have to admit it is quite creative. One of the first references to a candle clock comes from China from 520 BCE from the poet and thinker Yu Jiangun 
I think I'm butchering this name, so please forgive me, but this is how it's spelled. And he mentions candles that burn in 4 hours, were divided in 20 minute intervals, they were encased in wood so they aren't blown out, and they had very thin horn panels to let the light shine through. This is very, very fascinating. As you might have noticed, we haven't yet touched upon torches, but we will do so in medieval times. If you got this far, please take a moment and hit that like button right as I get ready to shed some more light on the miniature. Using Retributor armor, I am painting the straps of the celestial sandals. It is quite a stressing process as I don't want any of the paint to get on the actual skin as it would be very hard to cover. I'm quite pleased with the progress thus far but I did realize I might have made a huge mistake by not fully painting the wings first but we'll get there. With Lead Belcher as the first layer I'm starting the paint job on the mace and trying not to get any droplets on the rest of the miniature and make sure that the coat is even. Welcome to the medieval times, let's have some fun. They still had rush lights. Why change something that works perfectly and is free to make? They still had oil lamps. Why change something that works perfectly? They did change the shapes because they couldn't have phallus shaped oil lamps because of, well, religious reasons more often than not. And they still had candles and candle clocks. But let's talk about torches. As I've previously mentioned, torches have a very limited burn time. This means that Indiana Jones running down a dark corridor and exploring an ancient cursed tomb would be left in the dark really fast. A torch would usually burn for about, I'll say, 10 to 30 minutes depending on the wood, on its dryness and on the materials used as additional fuel. 10 minutes is not long enough. And if you start describing during your TTRPG or any other creative gameplay that the adventurers happen upon the resting place of an ancient cursed king that sometimes comes to life and they are holding small oil lamps it kind of takes away from the general atmosphere. If they have to put down their hooded lamp to fight, it takes a little bit of the wind out of their sails, but if they have a torch burning bright that they can also use to keep enemies at bay as Aragorn did on Weathertop, that's more appealing, isn't it? It's more vivid. But let's talk about how you could improve torches and why you shouldn't use torches inside a structure. When describing or depicting interiors lit by torches, immediately the image comes to mind of a sconce in which a burning torch is placed. This is true. Torches were placed in sconces. But Imagine this being in a medieval inn, built of wood. The wooden wall behind the sconce would catch fire pretty fast. The ceiling above would catch fire pretty fast. And if that didn't happen, some torches let out sparks and hot embers and hot ash that get on the floor. The floor is sometimes made of wood again a fire hazard. And even if the floor wasn't made of wood and it was made out of let's say dirt or stone you still had to clean the small pile of ash that gathered with every burning torch. And again torches burned for a very limited period of time so why would you try to light the interior of a house or a castle or a dining hall with torches that extinguish after 10 to let's say 30 minutes. Torches were used in particular situations. Imagine a dark gloomy night. 
imagine you really 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 need to use the toilet and the toilet is an outhouse you would need a source light you would have a bundle of torches prepared perhaps outside or even inside your house that you would simply light walk out do your business relieve yourself and then walk back in now you would take that torch extinguish it and you could leave it in a sconce next to your door for easy access or you could leave it in a bucket or something or once extinguished you could take it indoors but you wouldn't usually because they would let out some smoke and you wouldn't want all that smoke in your house torches had a very very clear purpose they were short term lighting solutions but there were versions of torches that were upgraded and we can see from different medieval depictions these torches being used during feasts or parties and they look like this these are poles wrapped in fibers wrapped in ropes or other slower burning materials but as you can see they are as tall as an individual in this situation the torch would burn for longer but the classic small handheld torch that we all see in movies and in video games and we also depict would not burn for as long how often were these large torches used? I can't say for sure. Most likely they were used to light perhaps plazas or marketplaces, especially during the months of the year when the sun goes down a little bit earlier. They were used in medieval feasts or parties, but they were a solution for a particular problem that had many other solutions, such as candles such as oil lamps and for the average user a rush light would be sufficient with that let's take one more look at the miniature now that it's shining so brightly before we wrap things up today as i mentioned before i made a huge mistake by not fully painting the wings from the start i got paint specks on the rest of the miniature while dry brushing would have seen that one coming huh right now i'm trying to cover the most obvious ones especially on the cloth it's pretty okay. Good thing my camera is not that good and does not show that level of detail and mistake. And to finish everything off, I am adding a nice coat of Storm Shield because I ran out of any other kind of varnish except matte and ultra matte. Welcome back, let's wrap things up. The next time you sit down at your D&D table or any other TTRPG table or any game with an ancient or medieval or even modern theme, remember this. Torches burn really fast and there's nothing more badass than taking on the BBG in the light shed by dozens of phallus-shaped oil lamps. And with that, thank you so much for the privilege of your time. I truly hope you found inspiration today or at least learned something new. And I can't wait to see you all here next week on Funky Monkey MP. Have yourselves a wonderful, wonderful day.